好的，那我们就请我们今天的主持人九燕老师开始我们今天的研讨会内容。好啊 ，So good evening, everyone. So I'm going to be your MC for today. Uh, I'm Joanne Ni, um, I'm TM teacher, transcendental meditation teacher in China, and your host for tonight.、Uh, we welcome you all from China, Taiwan. Hong Kong, and maybe some friends from Malaysia and the Philippines, and、um, for coming to this online event about the power of sleep. This event actually is in in response to the World Sleep Day, which is quite an important issue nowadays.、Um, you know, especially with the COVID situation and all that. So、um, we are we are introducing you, our speaker for tonight,、uh, Dr. Nancy Lonstorf. Uh, Dr. Noster received her MD from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 1983, and performed her residency training in psychiatry at Stanford University. She has also studied with Ayurvedic physician in India, Europe, and the U.S. And most importantly, she's also a practitioner of transcendental meditation. So,、um, without any、um, further delay, let's hear it from Dr. Lansdorf, all the way from the U.S. Good evening, everybody. I'm really excited to be here, and I want to thank all my hosts. They've been very warm and very organized, and I'm just really delighted to have you. Here this evening to share some knowledge about sleep, and I hope that I will be able to bring you something practical that you can take this evening when you leave and get a better night's sleep tonight. So, sleep is one of my favorite topics, and it's because, of course, our daily quality of life depends so much on how we sleep at night. So, as a doctor who focuses on natural health. And feeling our best, I prefer to try to use natural things like、uh, herbs and lifestyle. Yes. So I'd like to share some slides with you, and then we're going to take some questions. And I always have too many slides, so if I end up skipping something, please forgive me.、Um, but I will. I will go to the slides, and we'll. Talk through some knowledge about sleep and practical tips from、uh, the recent evidence in Western medicine, and also some natural medicine, Ayurveda, the natural system of medicine from、uh, India,、uh, very similar to traditional Chinese medicine and its philosophies. Okay, it's kind of a funny term, power of sleep, because we think of sleep that we are totally weak and helpless. <laughs> But of course, the power lies in rejuvenating ourselves, so the next day we feel our best and we can be at peak performance. And sleep actually is powerful. What goes on in the body at night is. Pretty much nothing short of miraculous, and it's like an Olympic performance going on in our brain and our body throughout the night, every night. I, oops, sorry about that. I wanted to share with you just a few background points about sleep problems. If you're having sleep problems, it's really important to check with your doctor.、Uh, About your symptoms, maybe the doctor will actually have some helpful tips. And you, you, if you're having a new sleep problem, it's not been something like all your life. They will probably do some blood tests and want to rule out causes such as、uh, medication side effects. Maybe you're taking even a medication over the counter for your allergies, and that's causing you not to sleep at night. So they have that、um, insight to look at everything that might be affecting your sleep. 
nutritional issues. We'll talk about minerals and vitamins and how they might help our sleep. And hormone imbalance, of course, we're familiar uh, with, as women, uh, those in the audience, women who um, from maybe 40 to 55 or 60 are transitioning big hormonal changes. And that causes often sleep disturbance, but there are things to do for that. And then a hormone imbalance such as thyroid problems. I've had uh, several patients who presented um, with sleep problems and it actually was their thyroid was too active. So ask, also ask your doctor if you're planning to take any new supplements such as any herbs, maybe you have a doctor who appreciates traditional Chinese medicine or, or other natural medicines um, hopefully they, they're okay with that. You use those and you feel comfortable to bring that up to them and to say, you know, I'd like to start this herb valerian. Is that a problem with my medications? And of course we can also look at these things online, but if you're taking a lot of medications, it gets very complicated. So best to check with your doctor. All right. We have now uh, just, this is just a depiction of how interconnected we are. I noticed last night as I came in from an errand after dark to the grocery store that it was almost a full moon. And indeed, we not only enjoy looking at the sun and, and basking and feeling happier when it's sunny out, many of us, um, or enjoying the the phases of the moon, but they have a very powerful effect on our physiology, as you probably know. You know, circadian rhythm has been studied now for some decades and found that it has, you know, we have inside our body uh, the timing of every cell is attuned to this 24 hour cycle. <clears throat> and on top of that, like laid on top of it, almost like har a harmonic and an orchestra. There's the, the monthly rhythm, especially for women having the circadian rhythm in balance, and then their menstrual rhythm is more in balance. And then there are even solar changes, uh, depending on the time of year. We're going into in the Northern hemisphere, the summer, and actually inflammation tends to go down in the body during the summer. So seasonal effects too. So the one we're most interested in is sleep. So sleep, uh, we think of melatonin as being our sleep hormone and indeed is very important to sleep. It actually doesn't cause our body to sleep, but it, it gives a signal to all the cells that it's time to sleep and it helps them to go from waking to sleeping. And of course, this is something that's not very um, much, or it's not produced much during the day thank goodness, because we want to be alert. But around 10, uh, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, it starts to really rise. You see this sharp rise. And that signals to our brain and body that it's time to start winding down and go to sleep. And we, if, we do, if we actually do that, we will tend to have better sleep and our melatonin will rise higher than if we stay up and push our bedtime late till 12, one, two o'clock, well, we delay this whole curve gets pushed over to the right. And then the height of the curve tends to be lower. So it looks something like this, and then we don't get as deep a sleep. And I saw in the questions, many of you were asking, well, how can I get deeper sleep? And one of the things I want to say is you, we want to align our habit of going to bed so that we take advantage, oops, oops, we take advantage of this rise in melatonin, this natural rise, which will make us feel sleepy. In fact, some people, many people will notice around eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the evening, they start to feel kind of, kind of sleepy, like maybe they're at their computer and they go, you know, I could probably really just go to bed, but Oh, it's way too early. I have so much work to do. <laughs> so we just stay on the computer 
<laughs> and then we get what we call a second wind, meaning all of a sudden, you know, maybe around 10 o'clock, we start to wake up again. And that's simply because we've pushed this melatonin rise. We've suppressed it by staying up on the computer with the blue light and the bright light. But then, as I said, the sleep is not as deep. So those of you who want deeper sleep, better sleep, starting to go to bed earlier will help. It may not help the first night. It may not help the first three or four nights, but don't give up because it's kind of like jet lag. When you fly to you know, the east or the west several hours away, then it's like that. We're shifting our bedtime by an hour or two hours or three hours. It's like having jet lag. Our body has to catch up. So I'm going to draw on this ancient system of medicine, Maharishi Ayurveda, traditional system of medicine from India. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is a teacher uh, in this Vedic tradition who revived um, the full knowledge of Ayurveda, which includes the mind, it includes consciousness, it includes yoga, it includes all of these daily knowledge of routine and, and how to live our life to be healthy. And it is yoga sister science. Ayurveda is yoga sister science, comes from the same tradition as yoga. So Ayurveda tells us that there are three pillars, pillars of health. They hold up our health and we have diet, sleep, and we have how we handle our mind or our consciousness. And as you can see, this little, this little kid, this little baby has no problem sleeping. In fact, I think we could call that blissful sleep. This baby's having a happy dream. And uh, that's the way we all want to sleep, I think. And we want to feel that way when we wake up and open our eyes in the morning. We want to feel like, oh, I've slept so well. And we also have to eat right to sleep right. So these are all important in themselves for health. You know, what we eat, our sleep, our consciousness, our stress handling, but they also influence sleep. Food influences sleep and our stress level obviously influences sleep. This is a lady who is practicing transcendental meditation. She has her eyes closed. She seems very we're very peaceful and, and quiet, and she is feeling that inside. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the value of handling stress and how are some tips that we can do that better. Okay, so a few points from Ayurveda. Do you need a bedtime? So Ayurveda says that the, the cycle of the day has 12 hour cycle and it, there are two of them you know one of them starts in the morning at 6 a.m uh, that's about where i am right now somewhere here this is the kapha time um, and in the morning we want to get up at, as close to the end of this time as possible so we're fresh and alert so if we go to bed ayurveda tells us we go to bed by 10 in the evening and then we sleep during this time where metabolism is strong and the body does a lot of biochemical detox at night. And that's why we don't want to eat right before bed. And then it says that, that this two o'clock to six o'clock, the mind becomes more alert. And this is why often we start to have sleep, you know, problems, waking up at 2.30, 3.30, 4.30, can't get back to sleep. So this is a time when the sleep tends to be lighter and the mind is more alert. So if you could think of maybe you have a grandmother who goes to bed at 8.30 or nine, and then she's up and ready to go at 4.30. Well, if uh, that's, that's not actually a bad routine, you know, Ayurveda says you go to sleep early, you get more deep sleep, more rejuvenating sleep. And then by the time, you know, early morning comes 4.30, 30, six, you're ready to get up. And if you get up during this early time, you'll be more alert and productive all day. So that's the Ayurveda prediction. There's some research on bedtime. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I encourage you to give it a try, especially if you're a night owl, 
there, meaning you, you, you've always go to bed late and you think that that's natural for you. Um, there is research that shows that even night owls, if they go to bed earlier, say instead of one o'clock, they start going to bed at 1130 or 11, that they have a reduction in depression and they, they feel better and more alert during the day. So even a night owl can become more of a morning lark, we call it that early, the early bird gets the worm, we say. So in teenagers, going to bed at 10 versus midnight means they're 30% less likely to be depressed, 23% less have suicidal thoughts, so you, we can really help manage our mood by going to bed earlier. And I, I think especially with the stresses we're under today and the explosion of mental health challenges for so many people, um, everybody to some degree with the extra stresses in the world with COVID, that going to bed early can be one secret weapon that we all have to feel better and to feel less stressed the next day. And somebody wrote in the pre-questions, you know, how can we improve relationships and they seem to uh, personal relationship disharmony affects sleep. And I will also say sleep affects uh, personal relationship harmony. So we can try to, you know, be our best. And when we have better sleep, we're more rested, we have more ability to so-called self-regulate, meaning we, we're not as reactive and we can kind of be more generous emotionally to those around us. Now, the need for sleep, uh, they, they eliminated sleep deprivation as a record in the Guinness Book of, Nor of Guinness Book of World Records. You know, that you've heard a Guinness Book of World Records, a famous book where they keep track of who is the best in the world ever in any particular thing. And they had a category of sleep deprivation, like What's the longest somebody could go without sleep? Well, they got rid of that. They took it out of the book because people were dying. People who tried to stay awake to break the record actually died. Even young, young people you've heard of, you know, I have read, you know, young man, you know, trying to break the record for how many hours he could play a video game nonstop and he died. And that's because the immune system of the body collapses without enough sleep. You know, this is relative. Don't worry if you feel you never sleep. You do sleep or you would not be walking around today. <laughs> you are sleeping, not as well as you want, but if you really stay awake for days and days and days, the immune system, it becomes so weak that the body gets infected from the gut bacteria, goes into the blood, overtakes the body, and the body just dies of infection from inside. It's pretty, pretty uh, dramatic, I know, but, but that's how important sleep is to our immune system and to our life. Our bodies simply need it. Now, compared to that, remembering what we did yesterday doesn't seem so important, but <laughs> on an everyday basis, we do need to remember and we need to learn. And our reaction time is important when we're driving and uh, our ability to read something and take things in and understand those around us. This is very much influenced by our quality of sleep. So, yeah, it's like being sleep deprived, like sleeping maybe only five hours or something. A person is as um, bad in their reaction time as someone who is legally drunk with alcohol. It affects us that much. And we talked about depression. If a person sleeps five hours or less, 
they have three times the increased risk of depression of someone sleeping, you know, eight to 10 hours. Cardiovascular health, if a person chronically sleeps less than five hours, they double their risk of a heart attack or a stroke. And if they're over 60, they triple their risk. So the older we get, the more our body needs sleep to stay healthy. So it's good to address sleep now. <laughs> it's not gonna get any better. And here are the stages of a good night's sleep. Uh, as you see, um, I won't go into this too deeply because we have so many practical tips, but as you see, we cycle in and out between uh, awake, awake, well, once we fall asleep, we go from a, a light sleep to a deeper, more stable sleep to the deepest sleep in the slow wave sleep. Stage three, or we could call it even stage four sleep when we get very deep. And you see, this is time, this is hours, this is an eight hour night of sleep. So we cycle and the cycles get, get, this is a longer cycle. We spend more time in deep sleep early in the evening, early, early in the night. And here's another deep sleep early in the night. This is all happening in the first four hours. And then we get not quite as deep, but still deep sleep. And then we get just lighter sleep. Maybe, you know, let's say a person went to bed at midnight I know that's too late, but it makes this easy to say. So by five to eight in the morning, they're getting mostly dreaming and lighter sleep. And that's okay. That's the way our sleep is designed. Oops. So um, here are just the EEG, the brain waves change at these different times of sleep, which is how they're defined. And we have the, the slow wave sleep. This is these big waves, slow waves. That's the rejuvenation cycle, the deep stage three, four sleep. And this is the REM. The mind is actually very, whoops, mind is very active in REM. That's when we're dreaming. And let's look at what these phases of sleep do. Okay, the deep sleep we saw from early in the night we actually consolidate new learning from the day. And even from the past two, three, four, five days, we're still consolidating or making that memory stable. And we're transferring it from short-term storage to long-term storage in the brain. And also the body restores and repairs itself in this deep sleep. So I think it's one reason why everybody's asking and the question, you know, how do I get more deep sleep? And growth hormone, which is a big rejuvenating hormone, uh, that gets uh, secreted most during this deep sleep. And that's really good for memory and brain, keeping our brain young, our body young. You know, celebrities, the big movie stars and, you know, all those people, they, they pay lots of like thousands of dollars a month to get shots of growth hormone. Um, but you can get growth hormone, of course, every night free by going to bed early and, and maximizing your, your sleep. And, and lifting weights is a good way to also promote more deep sleep at night and growth hormone. So people are asking, like, will exercise help my sleep? And I would say the research shows, yes, it definitely does. Um, but don't look for it to help necessarily tonight. Like if you just say, okay, I'm gonna start a new exercise routine today. So I'm gonna sleep better tonight. Well, you'll sleep better for sure. Uh, gradually over the next weeks and months, your sleep will get better and better and better um, from that regular exercise. But just don't get discouraged if tonight or tomorrow night you don't see the changes yet. <laughs> I want to say one more thing about bedtime. I, I gave a talk one evening and I got an email from someone the next day, a lady who was maybe about 59, 60 years old. And she said, I listened to your webinar. I just come back from a business trip and my suitcase was still all packed and I was 
going to listen to you. And then I was going to unpack, get all organized, go to bed and get up to work early the next morning. She said, you know, you talked about going to bed at 10. And when the webinar ended, I looked at my watch. It was almost 10. And I said, you know, I'm not going to unpack my suitcase tonight. She said, I went to bed and she said, you know what? I have not slept well since menopause, like 10 years. And I just had given up that I would ever sleep well again. And she said, I went to bed at 10 and I slept like a baby. I mean, literally she used those words. I slept like a baby. She said, that was my problem. I needed to go to bed early. <laughs> so she got converted and she changed her habit. And it, as I said, it doesn't always work that perfectly that the first time you make a change, you're gonna see it that night, but it can work that magically. So now we have the other type of the lighter sleep of REM, the dream sleep. Dream sleep, it doesn't really matter if you remember your dreams or not, okay? I think part of that is how much fatigue you have built up. Like if you start getting more overall rested, then you might start remembering your dreams more. You get more sleep in general, you might start remembering them more. But REM sleep, dreaming, dissolves emotional stress. And people, um, when they're deprived of REM sleep, they, they become more stressed and more likely to have emotional like reactivity in the day. They, it also does promote being creative. So in dreams, you know, there are many stories of great scientists who had a dream like K.Q. dreamed of the snake biting its tail and that's how he understood then how a carbon molecule was structured. <laughs> you know, it's like a part of our brain is working subconsciously to solve problems. And it works throughout our sleep, including our dreams. So also, there are very fascinating studies done on that. It also clears, like you can clear the cache on your computer and it forgets you know, all sorts of things that were stored there. That's what REM sleep does in the early morning hours. We need that REM sleep to kind of clear the mind. It's like erasing the blackboard. And then the next morning, our mind is ready to absorb more. But if we don't sleep enough into the morning or get enough REM, we're going to have more trouble learning new things the next day because our mind has not been cleared of all that, all that stuff that was in the mem short-term memory from yesterday. So avoid cutting your morning sleep short. So, you know, that just really means you have to go to bed early enough that you can sleep long enough to get the, the sleep you need before you have to get up, obviously. Uh, alcohol also interferes with REM sleep, as does um, uh, like Valium type, uh, benzodiazepine type uh, sleeping pills. Those are habit forming, but they also interfere with REM sleep and uh, some other um, substances do also. So we that having that alcohol before bed is not a good way to improve sleep. It may make you sleepy at that moment, but the sleep through the night will be lighter. It will not get as much deep sleep and you will not feel as refreshed and you will not feel as emotionally good the next day. I had a patient who came recently. She'd been on like two sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medicine and all that for many, many years. And she decided when she retired to work on her health. And she'd also been drinking about at least a half a bottle of wine every night, uh, if not a whole bottle. And she started Transcendental Meditation and she started doing it very regularly twice a day for 20 minutes. And she gradually started to change her diet, cut down on her alcohol. And she bought this, this band that monitors her sleep that she wore at night. She said she had no, zero deep sleep when she started to measure her brain waves at night. She had no deep sleep. She was basically going to fall apart, I think, because 
she didn't have that deep re rejuvenating sleep. And after about nine months of, we were working together with her diet and nutrition and her meditation and all those things. She just wrote me one day last, uh, about last month. And she said, I just want to share with you. I had an hour of deep sleep last night. You know, she was like, it came back. So be no, no need to be uh, hopeless that, oh, you know, my sleep's been bad for so long. Maybe it'll never get better. Yeah, it can get better. She's almost 70 years old, been on sleeping pills for like 30 years. And now she's off all sleeping pills, no pills. And she's sleeping with deep sleep finally, came back. So one, another thing that happens when we don't sleep that's made a lot of news and science is that our hormones change when we don't sleep enough, even one night. And we know that we um, secrete more cortisol, the stress hormone the next day. Our nervous system is more wound up. So we are more likely to get stressed out about things. Our blood pressure may be higher. Our heart rate may be higher. And we have higher amounts of the hunger hormone. Hunger hormone, ghrelin. I think of the stomach growling, ghrelin, you know, how the stomach can growl when we're hungry. And then decrease in the fullness hormone, the one that makes us feel satisfied after we eat, leptin. So what happens is we're hungrier. And we just want to eat more. And often we want to eat more carbohydrate because that kind of helps balance our deprived brain chemistry. So we eat more, we may eat more sweets or more carbs, and that really helps promote weight gain. So now there's something called COVID somnia. I just read about it last night. And that's neurologist at Johns Hopkins who specializes in sleep, he, he, said, he said, well, we call it COVID somnia because he said so many people are having sleep problems since COVID with either because they're recovered from the illness and they are not really back in balance yet, or they're just worried about their jobs or they're worried about their parents or themselves getting sick, their family or loved ones. So there has been a lot of disturbance in sleep. Although some people, some people don't have to go to work in the morning, um, at least not on a train or in the car. So they have more time to sleep. So a few people are sleeping better and more. So I want that to be you. So let's, let's see what more we can do here. So I think you know, one of the biggest causes of sleep issues are just habits. You know, we say poor sleep hygiene. We have habits that do not promote good sleep. And we're gonna go through a few of those. Uh, you know, changing our bedtime. Sometimes we're up till two. Sometimes we go to bed at 11. All those changes, or if you're on a, you know, you're on a work schedule that changes a lot, that of course makes sleep difficult. Um, there are certain diseases like narcolepsy and apnea, not breathing at night, you know, that a person really needs to have a, a positive pressure mask or some other device to help them breathe, you know, through the night that can cause. So you have to see your doctor and get these things checked out. As I said before, medical illness like hyperthyroid, even just pain in the joints, you know, arthritis. Sometimes people can't get comfortable. So, you know, there are many cures for that um, that work for a lot of people like exercise and uh, oil massages and, uh, you know, changes in diet and such. So there is hope for arthritis. You don't have to always suffer. And then, of course, illnesses that affect our brain biochemistry. We say psychiatric illness, depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar, all schizophrenia, all sorts of conditions. And then medicines, really important, as I mentioned, to look at anything you're consuming. And even, even coffee and you know, chocolate and things in the evening. 
tea too late for some people. All right, well, we all, we all wanna have sleep just like this. That's, that's the best. Of course, this baby doesn't have many worries. It looks like he's getting fed. He has a comfortable place to sleep. That's about all he needs. All right, so what we're gonna look at light. Let's take a look at some of the things we have to address to improve our sleep. So our, our melatonin is programmed by light. So during the day, we wanna make sure we get plenty of light. This is the morning. Um, melatonin is still high during the night and then it drops in the morning and we wake up. We wake up and then melatonin should be low during the day. This blue light, 460, this, this higher frequency blue light, that is a uh, very suppressing of melatonin and that we want that, you know, it's the sun is coming up where I am living right now and that the light in the morning is more blue and grayish, that's actually good because it, it helps to suppress melatonin and wake us up. And then in the evening, as we saw before, melatonin goes up. If we don't get enough light or proper light during the day, then um, melatonin may not be suppressed, may not get, it may not go down so much during the day and it may um, not be proper at night either. So we just wanna make sure we get good light, especially outdoor light. In fact, <laughs> this is a picture of um, India and a great Vedic teacher of Ayurveda and his, his students in the forest. And somebody asked this great teacher, Charak, uh, what, what can every person in the world do every day that will be best for their health, that doesn't cost anything and they can do in any season and it's good for anyone of any age. And he said, yes, there's something. He said, wake up early in the morning and take a walk in the light of the rising sun. So I don't know if any of you have this habit. Maybe if you didn't have to rush to work quite as early, you could, you had 20 more minutes you, before you had to get on a Zoom for work or start your computer then you can take this walk in the morning. And this helps to reset the melatonin even for the night. So probably one of the best things you can do to sleep better tonight is in the morning, go outside for at least 20 minutes. And by the way, research at Northwest University in Northwestern in Chicago, Illinois, shows that if you have 20 minutes of morning light you will have lower body mass index. You will maintain your healthy weight more easily. Um, and I think about in maybe in your culture, the tradition of going and doing Tai Chi in the, in the park in the morning and to the rising sun. So we, maybe that's a tradition of our parents or grandparents but these traditions that were there a long time, they're there because they are very good for health. And those people, you know, they really had some inner wisdom. And besides, it feels fantastic. You just feel so fresh and alert and happy when you've been 20 minutes outside breathing fresh air and, and looking at the, the rising sun. So actually that's the view out my window as of about maybe a half hour ago. And these are my neighbors who took my sleep webinar and they learned they should walk in the rising sun. And they sent me a picture actually of that. See how beautiful it can be. And uh, it's very inspiring to start the day that way. So at night, we, want, we don't want that blue light at night though. So we want, if we have to be on the computer or on the cell phone, you know, getting blue blocker glasses, um, I guess some of them say they block blue and they're not even orange now. I'm not sure they do, but um, traditionally they're orange and having lights that are more warm color, the spectrum that's um, softer and golden that will help and turning the lights down in their intensity at night. Uh, when you do go to sleep in your bedroom, you will have better sleep if you block the light. These are, this is a curtain that when it's drawn, all this light goes away. <clears throat> See how it totally blocks the light. And if you have 
you know, you're traveling or you can't control your bedroom light, you can get a sleep mask and then you can just comfortably, you know, block the light that way. And no matter where you are or what circumstances, you don't have to worry about too much light in your eyes keeping you awake. <clears throat> Another real great trick is to cool your body off at night. It turns out that the body won't, will not fall asleep if it's too hot. If the body has to cool itself off. So keeping your bedroom cool, <clears throat> that may not be possible, always that exact, fair, this is Fahrenheit. Um, but taking a hot bath before bed has been shown, those of you who want to increase your deep sleep, has been shown to increase deep sleep by 10 to 15%, which could mean quite a lot. <clears throat> so I, I, I think that the, the warm bath, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but because the blood comes to the surface, you might feel, find yourself get all pink. Um, it, the heat is radiating from the body. And when you get out, the body has gotten rid of a lot of heat. So it can be a really good way to improve sleep. Now, this is a, a very interesting point. <clears throat> uh, in India, in the Ayurvedic knowledge, there's ancient wisdom that says the direction that we sleep, like our head is pointing north or south or, south or west or east when we sleep, you know, on the bed. Like if you looked at yourself from the top and you thought of your head as the arrow of the compass, which direction is your head? And it turns out that this research study done on medical students found that when they slept with their head to the south, they had lower blood pressure and heart rate. <clears throat> and they um, found they were significantly more relaxed so Ayurveda tells us we should sleep with the head to the south and the body will heal the best. And we have to do more research on that, obviously. Somebody has to. But don't sleep with your head to the north. Go check your bed now. And before you go to sleep, if you're sleeping with your head to the north, you may want to sleep the other way on the bed <laughs> and see if you fall asleep more easily. <clears throat> um, Meditation is very powerful also. I wanted to bring that up uh, as part of this ancient knowledge of um, Ayurveda. This gentleman is practicing transcendental meditation. Why do I talk about transcendental meditation? <clears throat> there are so many kinds of meditation, probably as many as there are teachers of meditation. But transcendental meditation has been learned by many, many millions of people around the world. And there's a about a 50-year Bill, uh, accumulation of, of published research by peer re in peer-reviewed journals and universities all over the world on its effects for the body and the mind. And rather than be a kind of a mental technique that requires uh, kind of doing something or constantly, or maybe, you know, thinking of something or not thinking of something or, um, Transcendental meditation activates a natural response in the body that allows the mind and body to calm and settle down. And it's called in the category of self transcending. There are different uh, re scientists have categorized the effects of or types of meditation according to their EEG brainwaves. And TM is in a category they call self transcending, meaning it actually goes beyond the technique because when one starts to practice TM, the mind becomes very quiet and eventually just um, the mind and body enjoy this deep rest. So as a physician, I like the transcendental meditation because it. I feel in my patients, I see it, I see it in the research. It's like the most profound for the body as well as the mind. And it, it really helps to reset the whole healing mechanism in the body. And uh, patients tell me it's life-changing, very, very uh, much gets them out of a stress cycle and 
they never they never re really return to being so stressed when they're practicing regularly. It dissolves the stress from the day at the end of the day. And at the start of the day, it makes them extra fresh for whatever they have to do. So, you know, we saw cort cortisol actually, cortisol and melatonin are in inverse proportion. So when cortisol is high, it suppresses melatonin. So when we're stressed, we don't sleep well, right? I don't think I need to tell you that. So um, the good thing is that transcendental meditation, actually cortisol level drops con considerably during the practice. And not only that, but after the practice, the cortisol level is lower than it was at the start. So this was a group um, that they, they took, first they took controls, people who didn't know TM, and they took long time, like three to five year meditators in TM. They brought them into the lab, they had them sit and close their eyes, and then they had the, the control group just relax. They said, just relax for, you know, 20 minutes, and then you'll come out of, you know, being relaxed. And then the TMers, they said, okay, so then now you start to meditate, you do your 20 minutes of meditation. And this is what happened when they sampled their cortisol level during their meditation. Even though they were, um, yeah, in a lab and everything, their cortisol level dropped. It dropped um, 25, 27% actually during this just short like period of 20 to 30 minutes. And that's quite remarkable. And afterwards it did increase again you know, to handle the day, we need cortisol to handle the day. But you see that the baseline was much less. So after meditation, they still felt much more relaxed. And then they took the control group and they taught him TM. And after they had done TM for three, four months, they brought him back to the lab and they say, okay, now we want you to do the same thing. But after so many minutes, you meditate and let's see what happens. And now, even after only three to four minutes, months of transcendental meditation, you see that as compared to before, they were stressed in the lab, they didn't really have much of a, a drop. And then now they their cortisol dropped with their meditating and afterwards it stayed low. Isn't that lovely? So they came out of meditation and they were still relaxed even, you know, sometime later. So it was, it was very, um, very powerful relaxing effect on the mind and body. And even throughout the 24 hour cycle, the, the TMers produce significantly less cortisol than those controls. So 24 hours a day, when you practice TM 20 minutes, twice a day, your cortisol all the time is less. And that helps promote good sleep. Because as we said, cortisol is opposed to melatonin. It suppresses it. And um, I won't go into every study, but this is a slide which summarizes a number of studies on transcendental meditation and better sleep in a variety of people and settings from people who work in a corporation, in a factory, wartime veterans who have post-traumatic stress, prison inmates, people with chronic insomnia, teenagers, just general population in US or in Italy, even psychiatric patients. So even if a person has a mental illness, they can sleep better when they learn and practice TM. And I've seen that in my own practice. <clears throat> and of course, less cortisol at night. Also, Another effect of TM, a very interesting study found that during that time that that cortisol is dropping during meditation, <clears throat> also epinephrine and norepinephrine, or it can be called adrenaline, also drops. And um, this was measuring in the urine right after meditation um, that less adrenaline was produced during TM and more serotonin was produced. And we know serotonin to be precursor to melatonin. So body transforms serotonin to melatonin. And it's also, you know, the, the 
target of every drug not every drug, but major class of drugs for depression because serotonin helps us feel good. It's like a well being chemical that our brain and body makes. So even after TM, the serotonin was higher than in the controls. So again, less stress, more feeling of well being. Now, some of you may already practice TM, and some of you may not yet. And um, I just wanted to, I don't know if we really have time, but I would just invite you to look at this slide that this lady is taking her pulse. And if you can see me, me up, up in the corner, um, I will show you. I'm not gonna stop sharing because I'll have to, I'll lose my place in my slides, but um, just taking your pulse like she's doing it where you cross Women take your left pulse, so you cross your left hand towards your right shoulder, and men, you take your right arm and you put it towards your hand towards your left shoulder, and then you find, um, you take these three fingers and you feel the pulse, which is under the thumb, the base of the thumb, <clears throat> just like inside the side of your arm, there's a, a hollow, like a valley. And then you, <clears throat> you put the three fingers there and you just place them very lightly until you just feel the pulse. And just when you get to the pulse, just observe it for a few moments. And remember to keep breathing, breathe normally, easily. You don't have to feel it under all three fingers, even just under one finger, you want to have a light pressure. And what this does, you will notice if you take your pulse for a minute, two minutes, you'll see your pulse starts to change. Maybe it gets a little quieter. Maybe it slows down. Maybe it gets stronger and easier to feel. Your attention on your pulse is drawing your awareness inward. And it has a healing effect on the body. And this is a, a, a mini, like a miniature experience in the direction of transcending, transcendental meditation of the mind going inward and effortlessly becoming more settled and the body becoming more settled. So I just wanna encourage you that this is a way that you can improve also many things in your health. I've even had patients who told me that their hands, their arthritic hands no longer hurt since they've been taking their pulse uh, or their digestion is better. Just lots and lots of different uh, signs of the body rebalancing. So I just want to encourage you to use this very powerful technique. Just take your pulse two, three times a day. Just take it. If you feel stressed, take it. You'll feel calmer within a few moments of taking your pulse. And it's a real, it's real. It's not like taking a drug. It's like your whole system becomes calmer. So you, you feel with each finger evenly, you don't feel with more pressure on any one finger. This is a class of young people learning the pulse. So I think we're going to have to um, take some questions soon. I know the night, I don't wanna keep you up too much past your Ayurvedic, now your bedtime, um, but I will say a couple, I'll go through a few things quick. So, you know, healthy food, this would be too heavy, This all this fried food, all these oily noodles and things. This, you wouldn't wanna eat this you know, in the evening at seven or eight. Um, and you also wouldn't wanna have just raw vegetables if you're having trouble sleeping because either too light or too heavy can create too much blood flow to the gut and, and disturb sleep, make the body too active. So what's good for dinner would be something like this, a, a delicious, you know, Chinese soup with lots of vegetables and soupy, 
um, is very filling without being giving the body too much to digest. And that would be a really nice evening meal, according to Ayurveda and better sleep. Sugar and caffeine and chocolate will be bad. If you have a bunch of sugar or fat, saturated fat in the evening, sleep is less deep sleep and more awakening. So those who want more de deep sleep, have that delicious, really wholesome dinner and skip the dessert. Uh, those who are sensitive to caffeine, be really careful. Um, you know, one cup in the morning even, for some people does not get fully metabolized until the next morning, meaning it will influence your sleep. Now, I know some people have very fast metabolism of caffeine and they say, oh yeah, I have a cup of coffee before I go to bed. I just, it doesn't bother me at all. And it probably doesn't because their body gets rid of it so quickly. But a lot of people are very sensitive to caffeine and you may, you may be and not even realize it. Um, golden milk is popular now, around, getting popular around the world. It's always been that way in India. Turmeric in hot milk, this could be goat milk, or it could be in India, it's Brahmin cow milk, which is A2. It's easier to digest than regular, you know, modern cow milk. Um, but th some people find, you know, Ayurveda says best not to eat within three hours of, of going to sleep. But if you feel empty and you're a person who is maybe very thin, get hungry easily, then um, a cup of hot milk before bed should not disturb the sleep. In fact, may provide tryptophan, which is a, a chemical that your body makes melatonin from. Fish consumption and fish oils can help sleep. This was Chinese school children. Those with higher levels of these fats found in fish had better sleep. And it may also help prevent um, problems in memory due to lack of sleep. Magnesium, you know this mineral. This has been shown to help uh, reduce stress and uh, deficiency increases stress. Uh, I will just say that there are a lot of people who take magnesium at bedtime, like 400 milligrams or to 800 to help them fall asleep. And it's a muscle relaxer. And I know people who, if they don't take their magnesium, they lie in bed and they say, why can't I get to sleep tonight? And then they remember their magnesium and then they take it and then they fall right asleep. <clears throat> serotonin, we can't take serotonin as a pill, but we can, we can um, uh, help our serotonin melatonin production. Uh, it's, most of it's produced in the gut. So having good you know, probiotic food and maybe taking a probiotic if you have gut issues, that might help. You can also take L-tryptophan or 5-HTP. And there are certain types of cherries if you happen to live in the Yerta Valley in Spain, but most people don't have access to that. But uh, just a good diet and not too much sugar and not too little, um, uh, you know, uh, you need a balanced diet and a little bit of carbohydrate like from healthy grains helps. These are just all the nasty details about how many of us have sleep problems. Uh, five hours or less, this is important. A person is four and a half times more likely to get a cold if they're in a scientific study where they're getting cold virus stuck up their nose. Those people who are sleeping more than five hours a night, they, have, they don't get sick generally. And those who are sleeping very little, they get sick four to five times as much from that exposure. So really it's very important for our immunity. Um, another thing, electrical grounding. If you have smart meters and you have lots of appliances going and maybe your phone is next to your bed, your cell phone, or you have a transmitting phone like you can take it out of a base and it has a battery and you walk around the house. Those things are emitting different waves, electromagnetic types waves, and they can disturb sleep. And they can create an electric field around the body that keeps you agitated. So grounding, 
your bed or grounding your body and they're like mats that you can plug into the wall that have special grounding ability. They actually can help you sleep if you have a lot of these, this electricity around you. And they found, they did a study in newborns because these, these are neonatal, you know, premature babies and in incubators that have very high EMF in the incubator. And they found that the babies had lower stress levels, lower cortisol, and their heart rate was more the showing that they were more relaxed when they grounded them, they put them on these little grounding mats. So that was very, very interesting. And for adults as well, lower cortisol level and um, reduced night uh, cortisol and better sleep when they used a grounding mat. So just in a little esoteria, but you know, we have so many electrical in 5G and you know, all these different waves. So sometimes people will just turn off their electricity in their bedroom at night. If they have a switch on the wall, um, they can turn that, that fuse off for the night. So this is a place that sells those. I don't have anything to do with them, but in case you know, want to know, that's, a, a, I think, a good place. And uh, Ayurveda says that we can reduce the electricity field around us, the, the electrical, by applying oil to the body. So this is a quick fix for if you feel unsettled, you feel like this when you lie in bed, you feel like all your nerves are just like they won't settle down. If you put a little bit of oil, whatever oil you have, uh, organic is best, coconut oil works well, olive oil, um, I don't know what oils you like to use, but you can put them on your head. They, they will, they will stop worry like this. It's, it's, it's a bizarre, <laughs> but really, if you put oil, coconut oil on your hands and you rub it against your scalp and your ears and your neck and your, and the bottom of your feet here, see these places, head and feet, and you lie down, or you even put a little light coat on your arms, your legs, your body, you go lie down, you'll feel like a baby. All the stress went out of your nerves. It's so amazing. So oil is a good insulator. It does not conduct electricity. So those are, that's a really powerful secret. And then the last things, there are some herbs. This herbal product, and I think your organizers, they know um, maybe how they, you can get these herbs. Blissful sleep, traditional Ayurvedic herbs, they're just tablets. And research shows that people get to sleep 17 minutes faster. So if you're lying there for 20 to 30 minutes and it's, you know, it's bothering you, you know, cutting that in half can make a big difference. There are other ones that I like a lot. This, some of the same herbs in their combinations like stress-free mind. Uh, I found in some of my patients, if I wake up in the middle of the night and I just take a couple of these, if my mind has started to go a little bit too active, I just feel the whole body calm down again and just go right to sleep. It works not every time, but it works a lot of the time. This one is good if you're upset about something, like you're trying to go to sleep, but you maybe your boss was unhappy with something and maybe accused you unfairly and you're whatever, you're riled up. Maybe you're angry um, or you're irritable, then stress free emotions. And here are the numbers that it's a code uh, in the EU, they have code numbers for some of these. And then deep rest helps people sleep through the night. Actually, I wanted to tell you that, oh, this is another deep sleep tip. I have a patient who wrote me last week and said, Dr. Lanzo, I just want you to know I'm doing, um, I'm monitoring my sleep. Actually, he had a wristwatch that monitored his phases of sleep at night, how much time he spent in deep sleep versus REM. And he said he started this blissful sleep product. And he said his deep sleep went from a half hour to an hour the first night. It doubled. And so he was he was delighted because he, he was really have been having um, sleep problems for a long time. So these, these products can be very helpful. So you can get them, these are the websites, mapi.com, ayurvedaproducts.eu, and the organizers might be useful as well.
and uh, how to learn TM, contact your organizers. They, they know about that. Um, I highly recommend it. I think I've been in practice 30, almost 35 years now. And uh, I, that, you know, I, I think I help people through many things, you know, help them with their diet and, and heal in many different ways. But one of the most fulfilling ways is when people tell me they learned TM, I recommended it and, and they come back and they say, oh, it changed my life. I'm just like, they can't even remember and believe how stressed they were and how they could have survived without having TM. Because once they get it, it's like, ah, oh, I just, I can just dissolve all the stress twice a day. So I highly recommend it. There's a lot of research on the benefits for health and sleep as you saw. And the last thing I invite you to uh, take, a, I have some quizzes on my website, drlonsdorf.com. And one is on stress. And Ayurveda tells us there are three stress types, the, the anxious type, the angry type, and the depressive type. That's how in general people respond to stress. They kind of get lethargic and kind of depressed or maybe they get more irritable and edgy or they just get worried. And you'll take a short quiz and then you'll get a tip every week for six weeks that will help you, that you can integrate into your daily life that will help balance your type. So your anxiety will go down or your ang ang irritability or your depression or whatever. And also digest, there's another quiz for digestive type. Again, there are three types and there are different foods and different ways of eating and temperature of your food and, and things are different points are important for helping with different issues. So I give you a tip a week on that as well. So anyway, you're invited to take those. And I think if we have any que uh, more questions or time, we can take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lansdorf. Uh, that was a very, uh, help there are so a lot of helpful tips for everyone. And um, for tonight, I think we will start first uh, with, we only have um, a few minutes left, but uh, we will try to, to answer those questions. Um, for now that I will start with those in the chat box. So uh, what is the minimum sleep? That would be six hours optimal. Is that, is that okay? I think that's already been answered earlier. Yeah. So well, maybe yeah, generally, the next. Yeah. yeah, generally seven to eight is usually, seven to eight is considered better. There, there are very few people who need really less than seven hours of sleep and are thriving. Uh -huh. Okay. And then is it advisable to take melatonin for better sleep? Uh, if, if you have sleep problems and it helps you, it's a good way to uh, maybe help yourself get on a routine. Like if you decide to go to bed earlier and you know, it may help you to get sleepy and go to bed. But if you don't have really a sleep problem, I think it's better to just try to do the behavioral things and let your body produce its own. And one last thing is don't take too much melatonin. Like a half a milligram is about equivalent to what your brain would produce in a night or a third of a milligram. So just take a little bit uh, see if that's enough to kind of relax your body, get you to sleep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then um, there's uh, from Jay Chen. Uh, she has a high school, uh, high schooler, and then um, she goes to bed and, and he, she goes to bed at 12 after he does and get up at 6.30 to prepare the breakfast. Yeah. Then she feels sleepy again. Uh, at around 10, is it a good idea to catch up on some sleep in the morning or afternoon? Well, the truth is that tends to perpetuate the sleep problem. Like uh, it would be better to get your teenager to go to bed if you can, you know, at 10 somehow. Um, and then you go shortly after uh, because it'll help your teenager not have depression or it'll help them be clear in the morning, you know. And then you will feel more uh, alert in the morning. You'll feel happier when you get up for the breakfast, you won't be tired and you won't need to sleep because sleeping during the day tends to make us stay up later and it perpetuates that cycle. Okay. 
Okay. Also, one last thing is when we stay up past 10, remember I said the body gets metabolically active, we get hungry. If we up past, we get, we call it the midnight snack in, in US, like we get hungry and then we're eating in the middle of the night. That's probably the worst thing we can do for weight gain and for maybe even our health. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I don't know what Christina Love was saying, how to use dreaming to learn. What, what do you mean by that? Um, I don't know. There's a whole, um, there was something called lucid dreaming. And, but I, I don't think we have to really try. I, I think that the best thing we can do for our learning is just to get good sleep and to um, not use alcohol because alcohol will make learning go out the window. Even the things you learned three, four days ago, if you drink then tonight, a lot of what you learned will be gone. And if you don't drink in another okay. two, three nights, you'll have that for good. So I, I, I don't think we need to manipulate our sleep to try to learn better. Just try mm -hmm. to give our body what it naturally mm -hmm. wants. Okay. And um, thank you very much. And uh, I'll call for older people. They have enough. To, okay. So. So what's the optimum optimum number of um, hours for an afternoon nap, especially for older people who are, you know, uh, more than 70 years old, is there a like, optimal of one or two hours? Um, probably here, I'll tell you what the Ayurvedic says. It says that um, if you must sleep in the day, um, it's better that it's like 20 minutes a cat nap, we say, not not two or three, two hours, because then you would disrupt your night sleep. Um, there's a there's a buildup of a certain chemical in the brain during the day that helps us sleep at night called adenosine. And if we sleep during the day, we don't have as much at night. So um, and it's better to sleep kind of in an armchair or like semi reclining, not like totally flat. Uh -huh. And that means the body will not get as sluggish. If you've ever noticed, you might feel sluggish if you sleep for an hour and a half in the day and you cut up and you feel kind of dull. So not, not, not good to just lie flat and sleep for hours. Okay. Um, I think we probably have uh, four or five more uh, four questions um, and we're done. Um, I'm sorry, we there's a lot of questions, but we'll just try to summarize some of them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my work. Um, it is said that the bedding will affect the quality of sleep. Is this a core factor that affects the sleep, the, the bedding itself? Um, it, it's possible um, if people sleep with artificial um, or synthetic fabrics, sometimes that will hold too much body heat in. And, and mm -hmm. I know, for example, I always wanna sleep with cotton or wool because otherwise I start feeling too hot. And then if I take the cover off, I'm too cold. So, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, then the breathing natural fabric is better if you have sensitive sleep. There are people, some people just have deep sleep. It doesn't matter to them, you know, they can sleep in any condition. Okay, thank you. Um, someone says, how can I have a deep sleep? So I think this is all about having sleep, but he's specifically wanting to go through a deep sleep. Yeah, well, this is, um, I was trying to give some tips as I went along the way, like go to the great lift weights, you know, go to the gym that helps with deep sleep. And, you know, um, having, uh, going to bed earlier because more deep sleep earlier in the evening. Um, Let's okay. see. Ex yeah, exercise I think is one of the best things, and avoiding avoiding drugs and things like that. Okay, thank you. And caffeine. Um, Paul, is there? Okay, sorry, Paul. Is there anything more that you'd like to ask? Because I think we don't have much time left. Paul. Ah. Uh, so Paul isn't responding. Um, I think we would- I, I would like to address just aging. Um, one tip about aging, because there are a couple questions about that. Sleep does tend to deteriorate with age, but I don't think it necessarily has to in everyone very much. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think that a lot of it is cumulative sleep abuse is what I call like we've just, you know, shorted our sleep, cut our sleep and gone to bed late and irregular and eating before bed and so many bad habits for so long that sleep gets, we just kind of body loses that good habit of regular sleep, but you can get it back. Uh, I've, I have a number of patients during COVID who just mm -hmm. were home more and they really worked on their health and their sleep. And they said, my sleep is better than it's ever been. And they're like 70 years old. So I don't think it has to get bad. But one tip is that as we get older, the melatonin starts being secreted by the brain earlier in the evening. So that's probably why our, our senior people tend to like to go to bed earlier. You know, they tend to, they don't like to stay up most mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. They go to the bars at 12 or one and yeah, they stay home and they go to bed <laughs> early. You know? But because their melat their brain okay. is pretty yeah. sleep critical. So so go to bed early is important as we get older mm -hmm. to have good sleep. Even more important. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So from the chat box, uh, is there anything that you'd like to answer further? I think um, should be should be okay now. Uh, so there, Paul, is there any question that is very pertinent to you? Because I'm, I think I'm okay here. Yeah, this is a, there is one people as said if if the how to uh, is there any good way to to solve their sleep problems and to uh, or to to solve the ADHD problems? If, if, if ADHD problem? I'm sorry, Paul. Did you say ADHD as well as sleep? yes for for the children? Hyperactive yeah. disorder. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, yes, you know, you should go to the website that's TM for Transcendental Meditation, tm.org.org. And I think they have a section on uh, ADD and children and TM where you can Google Transcendental Meditation ADHD children video, YouTube. And there's some real, there are some pilot studies that have been done. And TM is very effective to help children be more calm and focused and they can do TM um, even though you think you can't get a child to sit and be quiet um, but with TM they they sit and they be quiet and actually before 10 they don't even have to sit they can do the meditation while they even have their eyes open so um, but it works I, I would I would highly recommend that as a first step rather than drugs um, and improving their sleep, you know, giving the child a massage, establishing a bedtime, you know, and a routine around bedtime, like, okay, now we put the things away and now we're off the computer and now we do the dishes together or now we, we pick your clothes for tomorrow and we lay them out and now, now we put on aromatherapy or some music you like, quiet thing. And then, then maybe mother reads a bedtime story if it, they're young enough or even rub their back, their feet with oil. I, I have some mothers who are rubbing their children's feet with oil at bedtime and the kids love it. They feel really relaxed. And you know, all these regularity and just having some attention from the parent and easing them to, to bed at the right time, that, that can be a big help. Okay. I think there we have someone, to have, go ahead. Yeah, there is someone asking uh, the posture of sleep. Uh, it is better to, uh, to, to have a side sleep or lie flat? Oh, I think it doesn't matter really. Um, probably sleeping on the, on the stomach, stomach sleepers. Sometimes people get more calm and they like to sleep that way, but maybe they'll get congested in the nose. You know, they're there are pros and cons of every type of sleep, but most people do change positions during the night, even while they're sleeping. So whatever's comfortable for you, but um, lying on the back, it's harder for some people to get to sleep. So they sleep on the side, it's, but kind of whatever works for you is fine. 
Okay. Uh, One more question. Yeah, is it possible to improve a six-year-old kid with autism with better sleep or to improve the, uh, the uh, neuron development in the brain or the connections and how? Yes, I, I think it definitely is. I have a nephew who was diagnosed with autism at uh, two and a half or three years old and he wasn't speaking at all. And after about, you know, about a year of, he, he, he got therapy every day, every day for like five years. And now he's normal. I mean, he's considered to be normal. Really, I, I think it is possible. It, it takes, you know, some attention and therapy and sleep. Uh, I think again, that, that routine of bedtime and trying to reduce stimulation around the child, even maybe turning the lights a little dimmer at night and getting them off the computer or whatever by 8, 8.30 and having a, a good meal with the family in the evening if possible with, you know, good cooked home cooked food. And I think all those things can, can create stability. And sometimes autistic children don't like being touched, but it may be that they would, uh, your child would like to be massaged or you can use like an aromatherapy like lavender oil or something that will be relaxing. And transcendental meditation, even at six, children can learn, they learn uh, this uh, technique where they can walk around and do the meditation for a few minutes twice a day even with their eyes open as they're getting ready for school or, and it has a very powerful effect to uh, increase neuronal connections between different parts of the brain. We didn't look at that, but you know, in this talk, but it increases connectedness and coherence in the brain. Uh, I actually taught my autistic nephew and he absolutely loves his meditation. He just, he just like, I taught him when he was like 10 or 11 and he was just like, oh, this is so awesome. <laughs> you know, kids are cute, but he, he, it was, it was very powerful even for him at 10 and he really appreciates it. It makes him feel calm. Okay. And mostly and autistic um, have a lot of anxiety. Uh, Paul, anything more? I think we can only have one more question and we're okay. There, there is someone asking if this, it is also help uh, for the dementia. Yes, I have a whole program for it. I, I think um, Dr. Dale Bredesen, B-R-E-D-E-S-E-N, Dale Bredesen has written some books on his uh, experience with patients. He's published some papers on reversing Alzheimer's and I have worked with dozens of patients and we are, it's not a hundred percent, but especially in those that are younger than 75 or are practicing transcendental meditation, we're often able to stop the loss of memory and sometimes they're getting better. I mean, about 40, 50, 60% of the time, they're actually recovering um, their memory and getting better and, and now being more functional. And uh, I've been working, doing that work for the last th four years almost now. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's very fulfilling. It's possible. It's, you can go to my website and learn a little bit more about it. Um, but it's an it's approach to evaluate nutrition and hormones and sleep habits and eating habits and stress reduction and looking at everything that can possibly be impacting the brain, exercise, of course, and then making everything in that person's life helpful for better sleep, better memory, better um, alertness, better nutrition, more balance in hormones, everything. So it, the people can get better. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're, we're really uh, overrunning with time. I think uh, maybe for those other questions that were not answered, We'll try to compile them and see if you can answer them at your free time. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. One other thing. I have a book. You can get it on Amazon. It's in Kindle. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Healthy mm -hmm. Brain Solution for Women yeah. Over 40. But 
90% yeah. of the book is good for men also, but it, it tells you the seven steps to recovering and to preventing, you know, brain uh, and memory problems. And I made it very proud to get the very practical, <laughs> very practical. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, if Paul has no more questions, uh, I think we can wrap it up uh, now. Yes, as it's already 940. Yeah. Okay. So um, on behalf of the whole group here, you want to thank you, uh, Dr. Lester, for giving us such very practical tips. And uh, probably we'll have a good night's sleep uh, later on. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, and I, I think uh, we will uh, see you again next time, probably with some other talks about some of the books that you've written. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye, doctor.